Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Elgin. I want to thank you for joining me today to talk about a gene-rich yet heterochromatic domain in Drosophila, investigating the strange case of the dot chromosome. The story I'm going to tell you rests on the work of many, many people, uh, and I particularly want to thank members, former members of my lab, as well as the current members, my colleagues who joined me in the Modern Code Project, and the faculty and students of the Genomics Education Partnership who have contributed to the work that I'll show you. I will, of course, start with some background information uh, on genomes in general, and that, of course, draws on the efforts of many, many people over the last hundred years. Our goal is to understand the organization and functioning of the dot chromosome in Drosophila. It's a very unusual domain <clears throat> because it appears largely heterochromatic, a configuration normally associated with silencing, and yet we have 80 active genes here that we are studying. And of course, I would like to thank our funders, uh, the HHMI Professors Program, NSF, Washington University, and at NIH, both the General Medical Sciences Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute. Now, our story starts from a consideration of genome size. When you look at a bacteria, you find that that bacteria has a genome of around 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth base pairs of DNA. But as you look at higher organisms, you see larger genomes. And in particular, in mammals, we have three times 10 to the ninth base pairs of DNA. Now, that means we've got a thousand times more DNA in our genome than a bacteria does. And yet a bacteria does everything to stay alive, metabolism and growth, cell division, and so forth. Why should we have so many more genes? Well, the answer really is that we don't have that many more genes. We have more. Bacteria tend to be around 5,000 genes, and, and uh, they can get by on significantly fewer. Humans have probably in the order of 23,000 genes, maybe five times more, not a thousand times more. So what's all that DNA? Well, it turns out that most of that DNA is repetitious. In the fruit fly, we find that about a third of the genome codes for genes, about a third is recognizable repetitious DNA, about a, a third, a kind of large third, <clears throat> uh, is DNA sequence that we can't identify its origins. It looks pretty random. What about these repeats? Well, some of the repeats are what we call simple repeats. They're a fairly short sequence that can be <clears throat> copied over and over in tandem. Uh, you can have a million copies of a seven nucleotide sequence. And we have remnants of transposable elements. Now, transposable elements are fairly small uh, on the order of, of um, a few thousand base pairs, but they are elements that can move around the genome. Uh, they're derived from retroviruses, uh, and from DNA transposons. So you can have the same uh, relatively short sequence of DNA, and relatively short here is thousands of base pairs, up to 100,000 base pairs perhaps, um, that can move from one place to another in the genome and can be present in multiple copies. All this repetitious DNA provides a lot of challenges when it comes to sequencing a genome and assembling the fragments. In fact, when people tell you that they have sequenced the human genome, they are exaggerating a bit. We have sequenced all the unique DNA. We think we have sequenced uh, the genes, uh, but these uh, arrays of repeats uh, have not yet been fully uh, sequenced and assembled. A lot of complications here. You can review this slide at your leisure. The point I want to make today uh, is that in fact, when we look at the genome of a higher eukaryote, a relatively small amount codes for the proteins. Some uh, additional uh, uh, DNA is conserved and thought to be regulatory, but the bulk will be these repeats, uh, retroviruses, DNA transposons, remnants of those, uh, and unidentified sequence. A lot of DNA that we're going to have to package up and that we're going to have to regulate in order to see the benefit of those genes. In fact, if you take all the DNA in the human genome uh, and lay the DNA molecules end to end, you'll have two meters of DNA in every diploid cell, and that's all got to be packaged into that itty-bitty space. 
that in itself is a challenge, but further we want to do the packaging in such a way that we can access uh, the genes that code for our key proteins, uh, that we can express them in a regulated fashion, while maintaining the silencing for much of the rest of that DNA. In particular, we do not want the transposable elements to be active. If they are active and move around, they can act as mutagens. So it's quite a challenge, and for some time, people looked at this situation and kind of scratched their heads and said, well, what about all this DNA? Is it junk or is it garbage? Now, there's a distinction. Garbage is what you put out for the garbage man. You hope the garbage man will haul it away. You do not want it. And in the early days, people who studied repetitious DNA were sometimes referred to as dumpster divers. Junk, on the other hand, is what you put in the attic, uh, what you put in the garage, what you leave in your room when you go off to college. It's things that you think are important that you might use someday. And indeed, there is increasing evidence that we have indeed used some of these sequences uh, in generating our current genome. Uh, the centromeres and telomeres, structural elements, are, for example, very repeat rich. And we have seen evidence that we can use these scattered copies of the same sequence to generate regulatory networks. So there is increasing uh, sentiment that indeed our genome is what it is because we live successfully with our repeats, we've exploited them. In fact, some people think that if we were able to get rid of the repeats in our DNA, it would be a disadvantage. We would become a prokaryote not the diverse uh, organisms that we are. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But right now, uh, I want to focus our attention on this question of how the packaging is done to get all that DNA into the nucleus in an organized fashion, and how silencing is maintained while <clears throat> allowing for the appropriate transcription. We've learned a great deal about the packaging after, over the last uh, 40 to 50 years, and we're now fairly confident that at the first level, the DNA is packaged with a group of small basic proteins called the histones to make a nucleosome fiber. This is sometimes referred to as beads on a string, but as you can see, it's really string DNA wrapped around the beads. This seems to be the fundamental starting place, and we have uh, very good evidence for this structure. This chromatin fiber is probably wound again in some sort of solenoid, uh, and the DNA molecules of the cell are organized in subdomains. We really don't know very much about these levels of organization at the present time, uh, but of course we can see the final metaphase chromosome <clears throat> in a microscope. Now, the level of packaging I'm going to spend the most time on today is illustrated here. Even before we knew about this, <clears throat> we knew that if we stained cells with a, DNA, with a dye that would bind to DNA and then looked at those uh, cells either in the light microscope or the electron microscope as shown here, we would see that within the nucleus there were two distinct domains. Uh, some of the DNA appeared much more densely packaged, as you see in these dark areas, generally around the periphery of the nucleus uh, or in association with the nucleolus. And there was a more diffuse region. Uh, and the more dense region is named heterochromatin. The more diffuse region is referred to as euchromatin. And indeed, it's this level of packaging that we have been working on when we... Uh, try to investigate activity states. I'll develop that in a few moments. I want to take just a moment to show you some of the evidence for the chromatin fiber. A number of experiments pointed towards this, but perhaps the definitive ones were first published in 1973, uh, showing pictures of chromatin fibers spilling out of a eukaryotic cell nucleus, where it was quite clear that the fiber did not look like a uniform uh, fiber that had been uh, a previous model. Rather, it looked like a series of beads, okay? Uh, and the suggestion met with some enthusiasm and some skepticism. So in fact, when the um, 
person who took uh, one of those pictures, Chris Woodcock, submitted his paper for publication. He got this review back. A eukaryotic chromosome made out of self-assembling 70 angstrom units, which could perhaps be made to crystallize, would necessitate rewriting our basic textbooks on cytology and genetics. I've never read such a naive paper purporting to be of such fundamental significance. Definitely, it should not be published anywhere. So, let us pause to reflect. Indeed, our basic textbooks of cytology and genetics have been rewritten. The inference from those pictures turns out to be largely correct. Uh, and uh, this was a starting point for a very different view of the chromatin fiber. I show it here just to uh, reassure you, if you ever get a bad review on some of your work, don't feel alone. Uh, skepticism is part of science. And it took uh, additional evidence from different kinds of experiments to convince people of the model. It's now well established, and indeed, that repeating subunit, the little bead, has been made to crystallize. Now notice the date. Um, this was 1997. The first observation was in 1973. Science does not happen uh, always at a very rapid pace. But here you see uh, a detailed picture of the nucleosome. The core is made up of the four different uh, histones. They are proteins that are folded in a helix turn helix pattern, uh, interacting with each other and forming a very stable structure. Note that they contact the DNA that's wrapped around them at multiple sites involving both strands of the DNA. So DNA wrapped around a histone core is very stably anchored. It is inaccessible to uh, RNA polymerase. It is indeed invisible to many proteins that like to bind to DNA and are looking for a specific uh, DNA sequence. So this turns out to be uh, the basic structure. Now the histones themselves are highly conserved uh, among species. Uh, and uh, you could think that this structure might be very uniform. In fact, that was a necessity for generating the crystals. But what's not shown in the crystal structure is that all of the histones have N-terminal tails that extend out from this core structure. Uh, and those tails can be highly modified by post-translational reactions that will change the nature of that amino acid. The com a common one mod post-translational modification that you're probably all familiar with is phosphorylation that occurs on serines and threonines. But a very prominent modification here is acetylation. So rather than lysine, you can have acetyl lysine, which of course changes the charge. Methylation, also of both lysines and arginines will occur. One of the more startling modifications is ubiquitylation which puts uh, a significant amino acid chain onto the histone at this position. And there are additional modifications uh, that have been characterized, and I'm sure more that will be found. Now, these post-translational modifications then differentiate uh, the nucleosomes and, in fact, are critical to the impact of nucleosome packaging on transcription. What we have found is that if the histone tails are highly acetylated, you create a situation that favors gene activation, favors transcription. In fact, you have made uh, the nucleosome structure less stable, uh, better able to uh, come apart, allow transcription. Uh, in contrast, you will find that hypoacetylation, a lack of acetylation, leads to a stabilization of this structure uh, and is indicative of silencing, of inactivity. This was first shown by work by David Allis, who purified a histone acetyl transferase out of yeast and found when he had the purified protein and characterized it, that it was uh, a protein called GCN5, which had previously been shown to be a positive transcription factor in yeast. So what this says is that when you are studying a eukaryote, proteins, uh, and they aren't necessarily DNA binding proteins, but proteins that can modify the histones can be positive and negative transcription factors. You usually see these activities in complexes, 
that indeed involve some mechanism for recognizing a signal, anchoring the complex, and then carrying out that modification. Okay? So the uh, knowledge of these modifications allowed us to extend our knowledge of euchromatin and heterochromatin from uh, something that was based on cytology to something that was based on biochemistry. So here I have modeled these two chromatin states where the yellow oval is the nucleosome. You can see the DNA wrapped around it. And notice the histone tails, uh, which are indicated here in green and here in red. So from the early cytological work, you'll remember we identified heterochromatin as regions of uh, the chromatin that are highly condensed as opposed to less condensed. We found over time that these highly condensed regions tended to be associated with centromeres and telomeres. These are regions which we then found uh, are highly enriched in repetitious sequences. They are usually gene poor. Um, and it was observed that the heterochromatic domains tend to be replicated late in S phase and somewhat surprisingly show no meiotic recombination, okay, in contrast to the euchromatic domains. Now, in the biochemical realm, then, we now know that the histones uh, in the heterochromatic domain are hypoacetylated and show characteristic methylation patterns, in particular, a methylation of lysine 9 of histone 3. Whereas, in contrast, in the euchromatic regions, we have hyperacetylated histones. Now, we think that impacts the interaction of the histones with the DNA and hence the relative stability of the nucleosome, but these modifications also serve as signals for the binding of additional proteins that then promote the active state or the silent state. So in particular here, we've indicated binding of histone acetyl transferases along with the polymerase and so forth. Here, uh, we have modeled the binding of a protein called heterochromatin protein 1, which seems to be frequently and prominently associated with heterochromatin, and I'll tell you a bit more about this protein since it seems to play a key role. Let me emphasize the fact that these patterns matter a great deal. I know it seems like, like a lot of detail uh, and getting used to the abbreviations and all these enzymes can, can be challenging. There are specific enzymes that modify specific residues of the histones. Almost always there's an enzyme that will put on the modification. There's another enzyme that will take off the modification. It looks complex, and it is. Uh, and it matters a great deal. It is these patterns that contribute to setting and maintaining the tissue-specific gene expression that is so critical for a differentiated organism. We start from a single cell, but as we grow, we differentiate our blood cells from our muscle cells, from our brain cells. And in each case, we want a cell that will use activity from a subset of genes, quite specifically, and we want that knowledge of what genes to use to be heritable. Uh, and that is indeed the characteristic of these modifications, uh, which um, are things that are added to the basic DNA structure. So in most of those cells, the DNA sequence is the same, <clears throat> but you see different patterns for DNA modifications, for example, methylation of C residues, nuclear organization, and I'm going to emphasize chromatin structure, by which I mean at the first level, the pattern of histone modifications, and then the pattern of other chromosomal proteins that associate. These changes that happen while maintaining the same DNA sequence are called epigenetics. It's kind of on top of an additional level of information to the information that's encoded in the DNA. And the message I'd like to leave you with today is that one of the major functions of epigenetics is to maintain silencing. Remember the bulk of the DNA in our genome is DNA that we do not want to express. Uh, at any significant level. And we have enlarged our understanding. We've found that silencing is frequently triggered by the recognition of repetitious sequences, uh, especially regions containing tra these transposable elements, of which there'll be many copies of the same sequence, uh, the tandem repeats. Uh, and unfortunately, 
the cell also will pick up on triplet repeats. That can sometimes lead to a genetic disability. Triplet repeats are just three nucleotides. Uh, we have segments of triplet repeats that are a normal part of the genome. Sometimes there is an expansion of that triplet repeat segment that's then recognized as repetitious and silenced, and uh, the individual loses the function of that gene. And that is, for example, the cause of fragile X uh, syndrome, one of the common genetic disabilities uh, that leads uh, to uh, learning problems. Okay, so it's important. So let's go back then to the fundamentals of what we've learned about heterochromatin, how it's organized and packaged to promote silencing, and what we've learned about this funny little chromosome that I mentioned at the beginning, the so-called dot chromosome. And now I'm going to switch over uh, and show you work specifically done in Drosophila. <clears throat> so Drosophila is the fruit fly. I'm sure you've all seen fruit flies. These are little flies that you always find around the bananas. Uh, they generally have red eyes. Uh, they are harmless, uh, but sometimes a bit annoying. And they've been used uh, to study genetics in the lab for over 100 years now. With a short life cycle, uh, cheap maintenance, uh, good genetic tools, they've been very useful. They have a relatively simple genome, 2 times 10 to the 8th base pairs. We have a very good reference sequence of the DNA, and we have extensive characterization of Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, because of the extensive genetic work that's been done on it. Notice also they are metazoans, so useful for behavioral, developmental, and human disease research. The karyotype for Drosophila melanogaster is shown here. You have the sex chromosomes. You have two large autosomes, the second and the third. So this is the second right arm, second left arm for this chromosome. And then you have this little tiny chromosome sometimes called the dot chromosome because that's what it looks like in a metaphase spread. Now notice if you consider other species of Drosophila beyond Melanogaster, you don't always see four chromosomes. Sometimes these two chromosome arms are individual chromosomes, each with their own centromere. In that case, you might have five chromosomes. Sometimes you have six. So rather than use numbering, when we're doing a comparison among species, we've called each chromosome arm by a letter name. The X chromosome is the A arm. We have B, C, D, E, and F. So as we get into comparisons across species, I'll refer to what is the fourth chromosome in Melanogaster as the F element. Okay. Now, in studying chromatin, one of the reasons I was attracted to work with Drosophila is because the fruit flies make polytene chromosomes. When they are third instar larvae, the cells grow very large. They endo-reduplicate the chromosomes. They become these large visible uh, structures uh, fused together in a common chromocenter. The endo-reduplication is active in the euchromatic chromosome arms not in the centromeres, and so all five arms fuse in this common chromocenter. Okay? This is where the heterochromatin is. We use the polytene chromosomes to localize different proteins as a way of finding out something about their function. So here we've stained the polytene chromosomes, and you'll notice long arms for 2R, 3R, etc., uh, and a little short arm for the melanogaster fourth chromosome. We've used antibodies to stain these chromosomes, and we find in this case that the staining is all in this common chromocenter where the arms fuse and along the little fourth chromosome. Now, in the slide I showed you previously, the karyotype was marked with the euchromatic arms in white and the common uh, um, constitutive heterochromatin in black. And by all measures, that fourth chromosome is constitutive heterochromatin it's light replicated, shows no meiotic recombination. Uh, and now we see that also biochemically, it's enriched for heterochromatin protein 1. Uh, it's enriched also for the histone H3K9 modification, which I mentioned earlier. This was our first indication of the importance of this protein in heterochromatin formation. 
once we knew where it was localized, we also wanted to find out whether it functioned in forming a structure that caused gene silencing. That's our inference in terms of heterochromatin structure. And for this assay, we could go back to a phenomena called position effect variegation, first reported in the 30s. In flies, as I mentioned, we normally see a red eye. There is a key gene called white that's required to obtain the red eye. The gene, of course, is named after the mutation. If this gene is knocked out, you have a white-eyed fly. Okay. Uh, Mueller noted in the 30s that following X-ray irradiation, he saw flies that looked like this, which he called ever-sporting. We refer to this now as a variegating phenotype. The key observation is that while the gene must still be intact, we are seeing some uh, red-eyed facets of the eye. We are also clearly seeing cells in which the gene should normally be expressed. It's no longer being expressed. Uh, later analysis showed that the mutation had created an inversion that juxtaposed the white with the paracentric heterochromatin. And so what we have here is an assay for the chromatin environment. If the white gene is in its normal euchromatic environment, you get full expression in a red eye. If it's in a heterochromatic environment, uh, then you see variegation. Okay, silencing. And uh, that enabled us to map out the genome using a transposable element. Here we've co-opted the transposable element. We're using only the, the ends, which enable its mobilization. And we have put into this element a copy of the white gene. Now, when we put this back in the fly, if it lands in a euchromatic region, we'll get a red-eyed fly. We then mobilized the element, made it jump all around. We did 7,000 crosses. I had a good crew of four undergraduates working on this. 7,000 crosses, we got 3,000 mobilizations, 3,000 jumps. We got 2,970 fly lines that looked like this. And we got 30 that looked like this, showing a variegating phenotype. Indeed, now when we investigated this, we found that in every case, the transposable element had inserted into the paracentric heterochromatin, the telomeres, or the fourth chromosome. Uh, indeed, showing that this is a good reporter system that we can observe silencing when the gene is inserted into a heterochromatic domain. Okay, we used the lines that emerged from this, comparing a line where the gene was fully expressed with a gene where it showed predominant silencing. In fact, there were only a few little flecks of red. Uh, and what we found is if the gene is in the euchromatic domain, it has a structure that allows for transcription initiation by creating an accessible region. These regions are observed sometimes as being nuclease sensitive. They're open to cleavage, whereas the histones protect the, the DNA from similar cleavage. So they're sometimes called DNA one hypersensitive sites or accessible sites. In fact, we see such regions at the five prime end of active or activatable genes. And in the case of this heat shock gene, other labs have shown that in fact, in the euchromatin, this gene is already set up with one molecule of RNA polymerase, uh, poised, paused, and ready to go. There's an upstream regulatory region that's also accessible. But if this same fragment of DNA is put into a heterochromatic <coughs> domain, uh, by the mechanisms I just showed you, we lose this accessibility. And in fact, the pattern of cleavage suggests that what we have is a very regular nucleosome array uh, that covers up those regions and the gene can no longer be activated. So we think that control of the chromatin structure state really comes back to the fundamentals of the nucleosome array. Now, this system uh, allows us to test the role of HP1. <clears throat> you remember, we saw it in the chromosomes binding to regions that were heterochromatic. So now the question is, if we introduce a mutation in HP1, will we lose silencing? Is it a critical part of the heterochromatin structure? And indeed, that is the case. So if we use a variegating fly so that we can assay the chromatin state, around the reporter gene, uh, 
We introduce the mutation in HP1, we get full expression. So that argues quite strongly that HP1 is indeed playing such a role. Now it turns out that HP1 is highly conserved. We find the same similar protein all the way from the yeast to S. pombi on up to humans. And it seems to play a similar role in each case. What does it look like? If you do a comparison, you find that there are two conserved domains in this protein, which is about uh, 210 to 220 amino acids uh, overall. <clears throat> this one uh, is called the chromodomain. And it makes a nice little pocket that will bind the tail of histone 3 if and only if histone 3 is methylated on lysine 9. It's a nice little hydrophobic pocket. The shadow domain allows HP1 to dimerize, and that forms a hydrophobic surface which interacts with several other proteins, among them a protein first identified in Drosophila as a gene that, again, if mutant causes loss of silencing, so SUVAR39, uh, it turns out to be a histone methyltransferase that methylates histone 3 lysine 9. Okay? So what we have here then is a single protein that can both recognize a histone modification and interact with the protein that causes the modification. And this characterization was actually first obtained uh, by work in mammals. Okay? And that suggests uh, a model in which you can uh, diagram out the potential spread of heterochromatin as well as its inheritance because the HP1 recognizes the modification and binds the enzyme that can propagate that histone modification. So that's very satisfying. It provides us with uh, a way <clears throat> to model the effects we have seen. But I should also say uh, that doing genetic screens, uh, Reuter and uh, Grigliotti and others have shown that there are probably 150 suppressors and enhancers of position effect variegation. That is, loci that if they're mutant, it has an impact on this phenotype. About 20 of those have been characterized, and many have been found to indeed be proteins that are involved in modification of the histone tails. What it looks like <clears throat> is that there are a series of modifications that are characteristic of the nucleosome and euchromatin. And in order to generate heterochromatin, all of those modifications must be taken off. For example, H3K9 is commonly acetylated in euchromatin. There's an enzyme that takes it off. And then all of the modifications that are characteristic of heterochromatin have to be put on, in particular methylation of H3K9. Uh, and that, of course, forms a binding site for HP1, as we just showed you. Uh, which can interact with the enzyme that does that, but also with the enzyme that modifies H4K20 and so forth. So it is a complex series of events that we think occurs at a cascade so that you shift from uh, open to transcription to closed. Okay. Now, what about <clears throat> that little dot chromosome? <clears throat> As we mentioned by <clears throat> all the uh, classical characteristics, it appears entirely heterochromatic. But it has 80 genes, and those are important genes. Some of them uh, code for transcription factors that are essential in development. Some of them code for DNA repair enzymes or a ribosomal protein, and they're expressed. So what about these genes? Do they have unusual characteristics? Uh, how has the chromosome evolved? How have the genes evolved in a heterochromatic state? And ultimately, we would like to know how they function in a setting in which many chromatic genes fail, as shown by the silencing I've just uh, shown you. OK. So uh, this next uh, slide summarizes that evidence. Heterochromatic properties. The fourth chromosome, or dot chromosome, has a high repeat density. A lack of recombination. Antibody staining indicates high levels of HP1 and H3K9 trimethyl, as I mentioned. Um, <clears throat> however, at the same time, we do see that we're forming this amplified chromosome arm, which is typical of euchromatin. The gene density with 80 genes and 1.3 megabases is very similar to what we see in the other euchromatic arms. 
and those genes are transcriptionally active at normal levels. So the first question we asked is <clears throat> the extent to which these characteristics are maintained over the whole of the Drosophila phylogeny and the impact of being in a heterochromatic state on the evolution of these genes. So students in the Genomics Education Partnership undertook to improve the sequence and to carefully annotate genes from <clears throat> the uh, fourth chromosome. And now I'll start saying F element because you remember the actual chromosome number may change among species. So our F element genes, which are in a heterochromatic environment, we contrasted those also with a group of genes at the base of the D element, which are in a euchromatic environment. Okay, And we looked at <clears throat> Drosophila erecta, which is fairly close to Melanogaster, then at Mohavensis and Grimshawi, um, which are uh, 40 million years from the last common ancestor. Okay, now in the slides I'll show you of the results, <clears throat> notice I will continuously use this color coding uh, for the four species, and I'll use bright colors <clears throat> for the genes on the F element and contrast them with genes on the D element shown in pastel colors. And what you can see, and this work is all based on the careful annotations done by the GEP students, is that the F element genes tend to be larger. They have larger coding spans than the D element genes from the same four species. Uh, and that seems to be due to uh, a larger accumulation of repeats. <clears throat> Remember the F elements repeat rich. These are remnants of transposable elements in the introns. It's also due <clears throat> to a larger number of coding exons. But notice that coding exon size doesn't change. The proteins themselves are conserved, uh, but the genes have become larger. We can also look at codon bias as a measure of <clears throat> evolution. You can look at the number of codons that are used in any given protein. If there was no bias, all 61 codons might be used with equal frequency. That's usually not the case. Usually uh, any given organism is biased in its selection of the codons that it uses uh, relating back to uh, tRNA genes and so forth. But what you do see is that the F element genes show less codon bias. They're using more of the codons than the D element genes on average. Uh, and we can look at that both in a um, very straightforward, unbiased way, or we can look at the use of codons relative to uh, proteins that are expressed at a very high level. The latter gives an indication of selection, selective pressure. And if you look at the D element genes, you find, and that's indicated by this negative slope comparing the two values, that the D element genes are under selective pressure whereas selective pressure is very weak for the F element genes. Okay. Another characteristic that differs is the melting temperature. <clears throat> You'll probably all remember that genes tend to have a higher CG content than the flanking regions, and therefore genes have a higher melting temperature than the flanking DNA. But you will see from this illustration that, in fact, the F element genes have significantly lower melting temperatures than the D element genes. And that pattern is reflected not only in the gene, but in the flanking regions. Why this should be the case, we do not fully understand. My point here is that uh, this is indeed a unique collection of genes. They show unique features that presumably reflect their evolution within a heterochromatic domain where recombination is at a very low frequency. We've also looked at the modification patterns uh, across the genome, and this is the collaboration with the MOD and CODE group, where we've done chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments to map across the whole of the Drosophila melanogaster genome patterns of, for example, K9 methylation, and patterns of the distribution of different chromosomal proteins, such as AP, HP1 and the enzyme SUVAR39. These are mapped versus the genes. And here I'm looking at the base of the uh, third chromosome left arm. And you can see that there is a very distinct pattern 
uh, a transition at the base of that arm from a euchromatic domain to a heterochromatic domain. And that is, of course, um, associated with a lower gene density, and although I don't show it on this slide, a higher repeat density. And you can see very strong enrichment is shown by these pink boxes uh, of all of these uh, modifications and association with these proteins uh, that indicate a heterochromatic domain. Now, what happens if I look at the fourth chromosome? Based on everything I've told you, you're probably not surprised to see that we have very extensive HP1 association and H3K9 dimethylation across the whole of this fourth chromosome arm. However, note that in addition to the K9 methylation mark, we also see very distinct spikes of the modification H3K4 dimethylation. This is a modification that's associated with transcription. And you can see uh, that quite clearly it's associated with a subset of the fourth chromosome genes. So we've gone back and looked in BG3 cells specifically for a correlation between the chromatin modification pattern and the activity state of the gene. And here we have grouped together all of the genes that are being expressed in BG3 cells, so the active genes, and force them to be the same size, a metagene, so that we can average the signals uh, for all of these. And what you see is that looking at the marks associated with um, heterochromatin formation, we have a very distinct dip, a depletion of those marks right at the transcription start site, and then those marks are reestablished across the body of the gene. So this suggests that at the transcription start site, these genes know somehow how to remove or push aside or get rid of uh, the uh, nucleosome marks associated with silencing. They return to that packaging pattern over the body of the gene, but apparently once transcription gets started, it can plow right through that uh, and produce the transcript. We then checked again for the positive marks, and you can see that again, right at the transcription start site, we do see this peak of HDK4 trimethylation. We see a peak of RNA polymerase. Uh, indeed, this pattern mimics what you see for genes in euchromatin. So somehow, the genes on the F element <clears throat> know how to create an open and accessible site. You can also see the DNA swan hypersensitive sites that occur here. Uh, so that transcription can get started, and then it just moves right along. In fact, if you look at levels of gene expression, comparing, <clears throat> again, for all active genes in a given cell type, genes that reside in euchromatin, in the paracentric heterochromatin, and the fourth chromosome, you indeed see that it's comparable. These genes have adapted to their environment. They're being expressed at the same level. Now, of course, what we really want to do is to understand what's happening at that transcription start site. We need to look for motifs, uh, signals that might indicate uh, a shift in <clears throat> the um, ability to form nucleosomes, a shift uh, in binding uh, of key proteins, things of that sort. And for this purpose, we've turned to this group of species. So the Modern Code Project not only did a good deal of uh, chip seq experiments, they also did um, RNA seq experiments, and they also did uh, just genome sequencing and assembly. For this group of species, these were selected to be in the sweet spot for motif hunting. When you're doing comparative genomics, you can't choose two species that are very close to each other in evolutionary time because they haven't changed and everything will look the same. On, in contrast, if you pick species that are too far away, probably the only conserved signal you'll be able to find is that that codes for protein sequence. We need something in between where <clears throat> the DNA sequence that is unimportant to the function of the gene has drifted uh, is no longer identical, but motifs that are important to the function of that gene are still visible as conserved sequences. And that dictates our choice of these species, which are 10 to 15 million years from a common ancestor 
uh, with Melanogaster, which, as you remember, is our reference species that's been uh, extensively studied. Uh, gene expression there is extensively documented, so that's our reference. All right, so our GEP students have been working hard on these uh, different species and <clears throat> doing very good gene annotation, uh, setting up the structure, the intron exon structure of the gene, and then looking for evidence to localize uh, the putative transcription start sites so that we can give the computer very discrete regions to search <clears throat> looking for uh, interesting motifs. And that project is now in progress. Now, at the same time that the GEP students are doing uh, a bioinformatics approach, it's called phylogenetic footprinting, to try and find sequences of interest. We've also been using a wet bench approach in the lab <clears throat> by looking at the interplay between a reporter gene that normally variegates and fragments from a fourth uh, chromosome gene, an F element gene, that can function very well in this environment. So we picked an insertion site in the Drosophila melanogaster fourth chromosome uh, and showed that if we put our HSB70 white reporter gene there, it variegates, as shown here, and that variegation is sensitive to mutations in HP1 and in the H3K9 methyltransferase, so we know that the silencing that we see is due to heterochromatin formation. And then we picked a gene, RAD23, which is a fourth chromosome gene, and it shows the pattern that I illustrated for you a few slides ago. It shows DNA so on hypersensitive sites at its 5 prime end. It shows modifications associated with transcription start sites. But then over the body of the gene, it goes back to heterochromatin packaging. It's actually located very close uh, to uh, a repetitious element as it exists in the melanogaster fourth element. So we're using fragments of this gene to see if we can change um, HSB70 white into a gene that can be expressed uh, <clears throat> in that environment on the fourth chromosome. And this just shows you some of our experiments to date. If our reporter, the white gene, is driven by the HSP70 regulatory region, which functions very well in euchromatin, you get a variegating phenotype. It's mean silenced. If, on the other hand, we swap and put in the regulatory region from RAD23, we get a full red eye. Here, we're mixing and matching different fragments. You can see here we've gotten weak expression. It looks like it's weakly variegating. Here, greater expression, but still variegation. We are still swapping fragments back and forth to try and identify <clears throat> the key elements. But what you can see is that if we identify some signal sequences using our bioinformatics approach, we could use them and test them in this system uh, to see if, indeed, we can get enhanced expression. Okay, so the wet bench and the bioinformatics approaches should support each other. All right, so some things to look for while you're annotating F element genes. Your first question, of course, is, is there a homologous gene in Drosophila melanogaster? And almost always, there will be. Is it on the F element? Almost always, it will be. Notice that I said almost. <laughs> Sometimes it's not. Are all the isoforms that are found and documented in melanogaster possible uh, present uh, in your species? What uh, gene model can you cr uh, create and test? Any unusual splice sites? Once you have a really good gene model uh, in terms of intron exon structure, now you're well positioned to start looking for the transcription start site. Uh, and there are strategies to do that, leading you to, to check for regulatory motifs, looking at the nearby environment. The pooled data that the students are generating from several species will be used in a computer program called MAGMA to hunt for common regulatory elements. But let me also point out that once you've characterized your gene, you can go back and look at it in Flybase and find out a lot of interesting information. What's the pattern of expression? What's the role of this uh, protein uh, gene product? Has a function been described? Is there a human homologue? Uh, 
uh, what's going on in terms of the utilization of this gene in the organism. Lots of things you can explore. Okay, so let me just sum up uh, in terms of heterochromatin formation on the dot chromosome or F element. We think heterochromatin formation changes chromatin at the nucleosome level, eliminating the uh, accessible sites, the hypersensitive sites at the transcription start sites of the euchromatic genes. And we think this silencing is dependent on the shift in chromatin structure involving both a change in the histone modifications, uh, the binding of heterochromatin proteins such as HP1. We have found that the F element genes are larger on average, have more introns, and less codon bias than euchromatic genes. Clearly they have evolved uh, somewhat differently by virtue of living in this heterochromatic environment. The F element genes show high levels of HP1 and HVK9 methylation over the body of the gene, but maintain access at the transcription start site. So we think this is a key part of their success in living in this environment. <clears throat> so, next steps. What makes F element genes robust? Uh, we are hoping that the Genomics Education Partnership uh, Project and the uh, Comparative bioinformatics approach is going to provide us with some new insights to this question. Thanks very much for your attention.